Hello, everyone. I'm Comron. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we will be discussing Book 5, Chapter 15 of Gardens of the Moon, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is part one of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Know that Comron and I think this series is the best story ever written, and we're approaching this from purely a fanboy point of view, and that we will be providing no critique, just pure love, baby. <laughs> yes. We will be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that have not read the books. We will try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. Now, quick warning, today's episode might allude to descriptions of graphic violence, both past and or the future, due to the uh, two-part nature of today's episode. It's not recommended for children, unless you are able to possibly follow that line of logic. Then you have my permission to listen, if your parents say it's okay. <laughs> Did a lawyer write that? No. <laughs> If I could have said it faster, it would have been. Rem- uh, okay. It would have been. Like, oh yeah. Remember those commercials? That we, that yes, we that's exactly exist? what I thought of when you said yes. that. <laughs> the disclaimers, the professional disclaimer guy. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> that's what we need. I wonder if there's any overlap between auctioneers and professional disclaimers. <laughs> I, that's a good question. Huh. Okay. Today we have one edition. We got a comment from Livia the Malazan Potato Noob on YouTube, (laughs) nice name by the way, regarding a question we brought up during a prior episode. Kruppa was sifting through the text in Mammoth's study searching for a reference to the five black dragons. That's the statement that Call made to Crocus. The text was describing the attendees at the chaining of the crippled god. I asked how long ago this chaining was because some of the attendees surprised me based on the age that I thought they were. Right. Livia mentions that this was recently discussed on Reddit, and they reached the consensus that there were multiple chainings, the most recent of which took place 12 to 15 years ago. This makes more sense to me than the single chaining that I previously thought took okay. place. Thank you, Livia, for your comment. Yeah, absolutely, Livia. We really ap- appreciate that clarification because I kind of thought it was recently, but at the same time, I thought it was a long time ago. So the multiple chainings, thank you, and uh, and mo- and recently is that that makes certain people's presence there more understandable. Right, and we're being a little cagey about which ones we're talking about because we don't want to get into that yet. <laughs> yeah, it's too early. Yeah, it's too early. <laughs> You're not ready. <laughs> <laughs> you can't handle it. <laughs> You will be able to when we get there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> chapter 15. The chapter begins with Quick Ben and Trot sitting in the little lean to shelter against the stone tier wall. I believe this is the same shelter as the one Quick Ben was in when he traveled to the Warren of Shadow. Okay. Quick Ben sat in front of five sticks linked by a taut string. Tots was providing guard cover since Kalam was still recovering from his wounds. Quickman thought about how he had known Trotz for years and fought alongside him many times. They had even saved each other from danger. Yet, he didn't know much about Trotz. He did know that Trotz was a savage, brutal fighter. He was also fearless in the face of sorcery. He strongly believed in the protections provided by the fetishes in his hair, as well as the woad tattoos done by his clan's shaman. Protections which may come in handy given their current task. And just a real quick reminder for folks, uh, uh, Trotz is a bar ghast. Yes, thank you. He's got a bunch of face tattoos. Yeah. These guys are more, you're thinking like your German nomadic de- Viking dudes? Yeah, definitely Northern European. Yeah. Did, did you ever AC Valhalla? No. I haven't played an Assassin's Creed game since the third one. You you should. I know that you don't play lately, but man, Valhalla, you are Raven Clan, bro. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> you're, you're you're Raven Clan, and you are, but it's it, it's you are like German, your Germanic Vikings era in in uh-huh. England, in London, in London around all these you know fight with the Welsh and all. I mean, it's it's crazy, dude. <laughs> okay, so it takes place. You, you start over. Uh, you start in. I'm assuming in like no, I don't know Iceland, Norway. Fin- I forget oh, where. It's some very icy. Okay. Yeah, you, you you eventually move to London. No, after about the first six seven hours, and you, your game opens up in London, pretty for the most part. Not not London. I'm sorry, in England, old okay. England, like okay. 900. I would put about 900. 
when did the Romans leave? It would have been before that. Uh, wait, five. Was like, it like, like five, around the turn of, turn of the millennium? Was it turn of the millennium that, that long ago? I, I don't know. I, I'm way out of my depth here. <laughs> yeah, so am I. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I want to think that they were at least, because I like that idea of that one movie of Arthur being. Yeah, uh, that's what I was thinking of. I was wondering yeah, when that's that was exactly taking what, place. Yeah. yeah, that seems oddly pl- pl- uh, plausible. <laughs> mm-hmm. I could be completely wrong. On that point, when I think of trots, I think of those guys that were the, the natives. Picks. Yeah, the, the picks. picks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Maybe a little more okay. muscular, but yeah. the, that tattooing that they had, yeah. that evokes the same imagery. Yeah. Cool. Right on. Okay. Quick Ben shook out his hands, then leaned forward to study the sticks in front of him. He noted that Hairlock was crouching inside his warren, waiting for something. They would wait and watch. Truss asked what they were watching for. Quick Ben said, never mind, then asked Trotz if he had the scrap of bedroll. Trotz removed the scrap from his sleeve. As he came forward to hand Quick Ben the cloth, he stayed well away from the sticks, giving them more room than necessary. That seemed oddly childlike to me. It kind of does, and I, I, I do get that impression from Trotz. And but I is is it childlike fear or is it just knowledge of Quick Ben and knowing Trots knowing what Quick Ben is capable of? Mm, maybe it's kind of superstitious fear. Yeah, yeah, I think it's from his bargast roots because mm-hmm. they are a folk that he's a fetish lined up fella. Not mm-hmm. just the face tattooing. He's they they talk they were laughing at Trots when they were flying here. Remember? Yeah, he he decked himself out in every. Yeah charm and fetish that he had yes. right yeah. <laughs> for the flight on the quarrels yeah. yeah. <laughs> imagine he's got about 25 bones in his hair and all in beard uh-huh. and all that stuff like... <laughs> yep quick ben set the cloth down and muttered a few words he passed his hand over the cloth he told trost to sit down and to keep his weapon ready in case things went badly he then closed his eyes and reached into his warren an image formed in his head that made him jerk back in surprise he whispered what is Hairlock doing on Reavy Plain? I guess he hasn't been keeping good enough tabs on him. You know, the one thing I, I, I was thinking that, but prior to what I was going to say here, I forgot that he was sitting there. They were watching him crouched in his warren so they were they could see him. Mm-hmm. But where his warren lined up with our reality, they can't. They couldn't see until he popped out. Mm-hmm. So that I hadn't thought about that. So maybe that's why. That's maybe why it, he is keeping tabs to some extent. And Hairlock probably knows he's looking for him to some extent. So he lets himself be seen in one place, but he's kind of popping in and out between there and someplace else on the rear plane. That's right. He was popping in and out of existence and yeah, frying the taking birds. pot shots. Yeah, <laughs> he's pot shotting them fellas. Yeah, mm-hmm. and ladies, I guess, of the crones, <laughs> the yes. great birds, yeah. the, the kin. <laughs> yes. We are taken to Perrin on the Reavy Plain. Vengeance filled his mind and flowed through his body. I forgot how angry he was. <laughs> Dude, yeah, he's pissed. He is. He thought Opan had used him, but now he would use Opan, even if it meant pulling Opan kicking and screaming to face whatever was about to come. A bit of his conscience bubbled to the surface, reminding him that Tok was his friend, maybe his only friend. Tok had no protection from a god, and his chances of survival were slim. Perrin wondered if yet another death would lay at his feet. Then he pushed the thought aside since he was here to answer Tattersail's murder. The adjunct had taught him to be single-minded. Then he wondered, but what did Tattersail teach you? That's a good question. We really didn't get to see much of their interactions. Do you think he Mm -hmm. picked up on the way Tattersail had a loyalty to the soldiers around her? I think on that point, most assuredly, because he would have seen some of their interactions with some of the bridge burners, and there mm-hmm. was a couple of other soldiery that were loyal to the bridge burners or to the ninth. It's the ninth, right? The old ninth. Mm. It was the yeah, second. What? It was the second, second. wasn't it? Oh, and then it. Whatever. And then I'm sorry. They merged I'm so sorry, with folks. the sixth into the fifth or something. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We've been we've been at this for several weeks. I've completely lost my several sight of months. which unit. Yeah. Yeah, several months. I, I want to say it was the second. Okay, second. Probably so. Yeah. But she but she seen or her parents saw cuz they they he was he was there at least a week with her, right? I thought it was more than that. I like thought it was two weeks like or so. 3 to 4 weeks. Okay, well then that's a lot of time to be locked up with somebody. It is. Yeah, and we so, didn't see those interactions. Yeah. And you can't. That would take mm-hmm. too much time. That would be several books in and Probably of themselves. Been boring too. To, yes. to be fair. They've been Pitching, you know, pitching pennies, you know, mm-hmm. 
pinochle, whatever they can play. Well, they, or, or you play, or you play a fiddler's odd staring games. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Parents said, "If things get too hot, pull out. Talk. Ride for Darujistan. Find Whiskey Jack." Talk nodded in reply. Perrin began to tell Talk what to do if he went down, and Talk said, I heard you, Captain. Perrin said, Good, and silence fell between them. They waited, and Perrin's mind began filling with what could be coming. Was the adjunct waiting for them? How would she react when she recognized them? Likely she would hail them, and there would be no ambush. And when she came close, chance would sing. <laughs> the deed would be done, and if necessary, they'd deal with the IMAS afterwards. He hoped the IMAS would simply leave when Lorne was killed. <laughs> wow. Way to be an optimist. Yeah, that's way <laughs> too optimistic. The biggest obstacle I need to deal with, eh, hopefully it just kind of works itself out, you know? He obviously <laughs> knows nothing of the Thailand IMAS, so. <laughs> yeah. Even if Chance was able to take a little piece out of his hide, it would be a little piece. <laughs> yeah. I doubt he could actually move because it was somebody so fast. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I, I will hush. <laughs> Perrin wondered at the efficacy of chance when it came to attacking the IMAS, given the Talan IMAS were elder creations, there you go. born of sorceries that made Opan less than a child. He began to notice how chance felt in his hand, and his confidence began to crumble. He wasn't sure if his desire to pull Opan into the fray would work, or how he would even perform the task. He began to wonder if Tot could have been mistaken about the ambush and turned to ask him. A loud, manic cackle stopped him. <laughs> Clicky feet's coming, man. Yeah, yeah. Perrin pulled savagely on the reins of his horse. It screamed and reared. The air seemed to rip, and he felt a cold wind gust against them. The horse screamed again, this time in pain. It crumpled beneath him as if its bones had turned to dust. Chance flew from his hand as he fell. The horse falling made the sound of a bag filled with rocks and lamp oil. <laughs> oh. I cringed at the thought of a living creature making this noise as it fell. A bag of blood and meat indeed. Oh, this is nasty. Is that yeah. how the ladies actually say it? Is it? Does it have an apostrophe in there like a lot of fantasy does? I think so. Does it have the apostrophe? Like, like chalice to Arl? Is it like, is it nasty? I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we've just nailed it down. Okay. Yeah. That's that. We'll add that to the ever burgeoning. Uh... If they don't, then I think that would be grammatically correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Okay. Tox shot an arrow and it snapped against something hard. Perrin pushed himself onto his side and looked up. He saw Hairlock as he floated above the ground 20 feet in front of them. Tox shot a second arrow at Hairlock. It shattered against his body. Hairlock laughed and turned a mad stare at Tok. He gestured. Perrin cried out as Tok was thrown through the air. He cartwheeled. Then a tear opened in front of him. He flew into it, falling into swirling mists. Then the tear closed with a snap. And just like that, Tok was gone. This had to have been only a matter of seconds. And what a shock that had to be to Perrin. Oh, it's horrifying. I mean, it's a close traveling a companion is just ripped away from him. And you have this puppet who he is aware of who he is, but just this is another image that sticks with me from this. There are so many in this Guards of the Moon. I have so many of these mental images and Hairlock floating there in front of them and making talk disappear and just menacing parent here is just one of those moments. The way he's floating, it's almost Magneto-esque, isn't it? It is. It's a very Magneto-esque. <laughs> yeah. It's a little more horrifying because to me, it's like there's, there, there's, there's more to Hairlock. Oh, yeah. Hairlock descended slowly to the ground. He adjusted his tattered clothing, then began walking towards Perrin. That right there, adjusting the clothing, yes. I don't like it. I don't like it I don't it at like all. that. I don't love this. <laughs> I don't love it. <laughs> I don't love it. Hairlock said, I thought it might be you. Isn't vengeance sweeter than honey, eh, Captain? Your death will be long, protracted, and very, very painful. Imagine my pleasure at seeing you like this. Perrin pushed the horse off of him, and he scrambled to his feet, then dove towards Chance. He rolled, grabbing it, and regained his feet. Hairlock dismissed the sword. He said, That weapon is not for me, Captain. It'll not even cut me, so wail away. A wave of despair came over Perrin as he raised the sword. Hairlock stopped and cocked his head. 
He whirled to face the north and snarled, Impossible! Perrin heard the howling of hounds. And like I said, more than anything, I have so much imagery of him, but that him floating there is one of them. But any encounter with Harlock is notable and particularly scary. But I, and I was never frightened of the idea of Chucky. Because you can just pick that fellow up by the back of his neck. He can't touch you. But Harlock, he's an insane high mage in a puppet's body. Now that is something to be terrified by. Yeah, you saw what he just did to talk. Yeah, casually. And then when he was attacking the Hound in Tattersail's quarters, whatever that magic was he was using, it, you know, it was chaos, right? But yeah. the color of it's, it really, it was gray with speckles in it. Very yeah, odd compared nasty. to what you generally think of as magic, right? Yeah. And he's just casual about it. He's so powerful, he just rips these these tears you know this rips up open no, no problem what he did to the horse right here yeah everything yeah quick ben had watched the ambush from within the hut he was terribly confused he wondered what perrin was doing and where tattersail was he whispered hood's path talk about losing track again what i was talking about earlier <laughs> right. he's like super confused about this whole situation there hadn't been enough time for him to save the one-eyed man Quick Ben's eyes flew open, and he snatched up the scrap of cloth Trotz had handed him. He hissed, Sorry, hear me, woman. I know you. I know who you are. Cotillion, patron of assassins, the rope. I call upon you. A presence entered his mind. A man's voice said, Well done, Quick Ben. Quick Ben said, I have a message for you, rope, for Shadow Throne. He felt a sense of tension in his head. He continued, a deal's been struck. Your lord's hounds hunger for vengeance. I haven't time to explain it all now. Leave that to Shadow Throne. I'm about to give to you the location of the one Shadow Throne seeks. The rope said, I provide the link, correct? The means by which you stay alive in all this? I congratulate you, Quick Ben. Few mortals have ever succeeded in avoiding my lord's inclination to double cross. <laughs> it seems you have outwitted him. Very well. Convey to me this location. Shadow Throne will receive it immediately. Quick Ben sent forth Hairlock's precise location on the Reavy plane. He hoped the hounds would get there in time, since he had a lot of questions he wanted to ask Perrin, and he wanted Perrin to reach him alive. In the interim, all he had to do was prevent Hairlock's escape. This ability Cotillion has to speak immediately with Shadow Throne is important. I guess they simply haven't been communicating with each other that much. Otherwise, Cotillion would have known that Perrin was still alive in Chapter 13, right? Because yeah, Sari was yeah. thinking about it, and she remembered that she killed Perrin and yeah. a couple other people, right? There's a, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we wondered about, and we I, 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 I know we wondered about this in a previous episode. I'm not sure which one, but yeah, there was some information that was like, what, I thought you would have known that. Mm -hmm. you know, I thought y'all were tighter than that. They both have so much going on. Maybe they, they just aren't in sync. They're they're in sync, but they're counting on each other to stick to the plan. Well, they're on, in sync on their goal, but what yes. I mean by that is they're not having weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings right. where they're giving. Yeah, this is not upper management. Yeah, he's not. He's not. He's not submitting his tr his TPS reports. <laughs> <laughs> TPS reports are not being submitted. No. <laughs> Tool had been squatting before the standing stone since dawn. In the interim, Lorne had wandered the nearby hills. She knew now that what they were doing was wrong, and the consequences went far beyond the efforts of the Malazan Empire. I like this quote. The Talan Imas worked in the span of millennia, their purposes their own. Yet their endless war had become her endless war. Lassine's empire was a shadow of the first empire. The difference lay in that the IMAS conducted genocide against another species. Malas killed its own. Humanity had not climbed up since the dark age of the IMAS. It had spiraled down, end quote. I have to wonder if the population growth has something to do with this. The Talan IMAS were tribal and their populations seemed to have some loyalty to each other. As the population of humans climbed, the tribes became empires and the power struggles began. What do you think about that? I think there's a lot of that. But uh, they, they, they are human, so yeah, they would rise and be all this stuff. But uh, I guess it was, is it just their fear slash hatred of the Jag Hut that united the Talana mass? 
I think so. Stop what they were doing. Again, we don't remember any specific examples that where it was cited the exact cause of them taking the vow. Yeah, not that I'm aware of. There had to be one, though, and, you know, it's three and a half million words. Sorry, I don't remember if we did. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> if it is yeah. covered somewhere in there. I seem to remember some offhand mention of it, but yeah. we'll get there when I, we get too. there. <laughs> and again, folks, it, 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 like you said, there was three and a half million words. We don't know everything. And if you want to remind us where this where this stuff is, uh, just remember, just we're not we're trying to be spoiler free. If you're sending us stuff information, you can always contact us at contact at horsefrogproductions dot com. Lauren had watched Tool for the past hour. It was near noon, and he had not moved an inch. She climbed another hill, and at the summit, she found herself not 30 feet from four mounted travelers. It was hard to tell who was more surprised, but Lorne attacked first. She pulled her sword out and sprang forward to close the distance. She had come upon Crocus and company, but of course, she doesn't know who they are. Right. She noted that Crocus and Kruppa were essentially unarmed. A gaudily dressed Marilio was pulling out his rapier. The three rode mules. I thought they were riding donkeys. Is this a case of someone just kind of using them interchangeably, not being aware of differences? I have to think he knows the difference between a mule and a I would think so as well. So maybe this is just because this person is a different person and it thinks it's mules over donkeys. <laughs> but am, am I right in thinking that last chapter they said it was donkeys? I, it was donkeys, yeah. Okay. I'm pretty sure okay. it was donkeys, yeah. Okay. Do we need to cover what a mule is? <laughs> I, I can do that for you. I have it ready to go. Why it's, not? A, a, a mule is the offspring of a male donkey and a female horse. Now, mules are are sterile, I believe. They are, yes. Um, but yeah, it's it, 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 but they they look just like a donkey. But they're I believe they're just a little bit strong. But the mule, mules, it says, are generally patient, sure-footed, intelligent, and have an even temper. So donkeys can be more temperamental too. Mm-hmm. So it's basically the equivalent of a liger in horse form. Um, elaborate, please. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. It's exactly what it is. <laughs> nice. Bad gum. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Lauren's attention was on call. <laughs> he was the first to react. He bellowed and spurred his mount forward, then pulled his sword from its scabbard. Kruppa attempted to open a warren, and the Odotaro blade steamed in Lauren's hands before a cold wash of air poured from it. Kruppa's eyes widened, then he reeled back in his saddle and rolled over the mule's rump. Crocus leapt down and was unsure on whether to pull his knife out or to check on Kruppa. I'm kind of curious what Kruppa would have done to him. If she hadn't had auditorial. That's a good question because, again, what is his warrant? Maybe he would yeah. pull the sword from her hand or something, pretending something. it's a little sweet cake or something. Who knows? <laughs> I got, I'm curious. I, I'm really curious. I never thought about it so much before, but now you talk about it. It's like, and, and yeah, I'm like, oh, man. Well, it, it's that done on purpose just so we just, he was going to use his power for once in front of us. And it's, it's like, whoops, sorry. <laughs> auditorial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. There's been another mention of him using his warren. I think Baruch explicitly told him to use his warren one time, didn't he? Yes. Ready his warren. Didn't yeah. he tell him to ready his warren or yeah. something like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we know he has one. Ow. And outside of him burgling the sweet cakes as he walked through the town square that one time. Yeah. Or the market, rather. Uh, we haven't really seen its I'm exact still unsure. nature. Ow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He is an enigma, folks. <laughs> As Call rode past Crocus, Crocus decided that he would check on Kruppa instead of pulling his weapon out. This all happened in the blink of an eye. Then Call was upon Lorne. He swung his sword. Lorne dodged in front of his horse, coming up on the left side, opposite his sword arm. The horse reared, and Lorne darted past, slicing her blade across Call's thigh, Ow. above his armor. Yes, yeah, that's a bad spot. Hell. The blade sliced through the chain links, leather, and flesh easily. Mm. Call grunted and clapped a hand over the gushing wound. The horse threw him from his saddle. <laughs> that, that'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> the second part of the chapter. <laughs> There's going to be ramifications for that. Yes. Yes. 
Lauren ignored Call and engaged Murillo. He deftly disengaged her attempted beat on his weapon, and her momentum carried her forward. Murillo extended his rapier, and the tip entered her shoulder. Angered that she was wounded, she swung savagely at his head and landed a blow with the flat of her blade on his forehead. He sprawled back like a limp doll. She turned to see Call was preoccupied with attempting to stem the flow of blood, and she turned back to Crocus. Kruppa was still unconscious. Suddenly, the thought occurred to her that she may not have needed to attack these men. <laughs> Tool wasn't in sight, and she had mercenary garb on. She may have been able to talk her way out of the situation, and she didn't like violence. Either way, it was too late now. Well, that's, uh, you know, <laughs> that's great. Right, right, right. Good thought about it. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> again, again, oh, this is going to be a holy grail moment. <laughs> It's like it's like Galahad charging the wedding party. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, was he like ten guys in? It's like sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. <laughs> the morning was beginning already. Uh, yes, yes. Yep. Oh. In Daru, Crocus said, "We meant no harm. Leave us be." She hesitated. His suggestion surprised her. She responded in Daru. Agreed. Patch up your friends and steer clear. Crocus told her they would camp there that night, recover, then head to Darujistan in the morning. Lorne stepped back and said, Do that, and you'll stay alive. Try anything else, and I'll kill you all. Understood? Crocus nodded. Man, four on one, and the, her confidence level is really impressive. Yeah. yeah, it is. She did get stabbed, though. She did, in the shoulder. Yes. Yeah, that's kind of that's that can't feel. I mean, getting stabbed's got to hurt. <laughs> yes, I've been I've I've stepped on a nail. You know mm -hmm. that's you know that's not well that's not very pleasant. <laughs> yeah, depending on where it is in the shoulder, if you yeah. hit some parts, the whole arm could be immobilized. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. nasty. Yeah, Lauren backed away and headed north, attempting to mislead them of her true destination. She headed that way for a time, then worked her way back towards Tool. She wondered what had brought the men out here but she didn't suspect it had anything to do with her or the barrow. As she distanced herself, she saw Crocus run to Call to check on him. She thought that Marilio would awaken with a headache. Call had lost a ton of blood and could either live or die. Kruppa may have broken his neck, but he was harmless around her anyway. That left Crocus as the only threat, and since when had she had cause to fear a boy? I don't think she's wrong with this assessment. I'm not even sure that him being the coin bearer would matter in this case, since the sword may dampen whatever sway Opon would have had on the situation. Is Lorne aware of the coin bearer? Or is she just looking for sorry slash the rope slash cotillion and the Jag Hut's barrow? I don't think she's aware of it. I'm just bringing it up. Oh, okay. okay. Just based on her assessment of the situation. I don't even think Crocus could contribute that much. No. Regardless. No, not in this situation. He's completely surprised, and he's—I mm. mean, this kid's in shock. I mean, he didn't he—that's he, how he's—he's he's green. I mean, mm -hmm. he's green, and he, he did better facing uh, facing the assassins on the rooftop than he did here. But, well, he was on his home turf there. That's true. Yeah, that's very true. Out here in the open, in the open field, in the open sunlight. I'm assuming <laughs> just some guys yeah, out was, hanging out like riding the horses. Yeah. After Quick Ben cut contact with her, Sorry immediately contacted Shadow Throne. Shadow Throne had fumed briefly, and once he had informed Cotillion that Ben Adiphon Delat had been a priest of Shadow, Cotillion had joined him in anger. <laughs> Quick Ben would pay for his many deceits. Remember this promise. Mm -hmm. Shadow Throne had the hounds ready, and Sari was sure they closed the hunt. As she continued on her journey through the Warren of Shadow, she met ever-increasing resistance. Every step she took eastward became more difficult. Finally, she gave up and emerged in the Gadrobi foothills. It was around noon, and the party was half a mile ahead. She was able to close the gap quickly. She found herself wondering to what and to whom was the coin bearer riding. The party was 50 yards ahead, climbing a hill. They reached the summit and disappeared from view. Suddenly, the sounds of fighting came from the hilltop, and she felt the unveiling of Odotarl. Rage flashed as a very personal memory of Odotaro came to her. She cautiously sought a vantage point at the crest of the hill. I want to know more about what's going on with that. 
yes. the cotillion, having some memory of Odotaro. Is this um, the Night of Knives? I don't remember anything like that happening. I, I don't either. I was just curious. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry found the exchange over. The coin bearer's party nearly wiped out. She also recognized adjunct Lorne and recognized that Lorne was likely on a mission for the Empress, one which involved a Talani mass who was still out of sight but close. Sorry caught the conversation between Crocus and Lorne. This put her suspicions that the Coinbearer's party were agents of the Malazan Empire to rest. Perhaps their master had sensed the Talani mass and sent them to investigate. Sorry would investigate the adjunct's mission later, but now it was time to kill the Coinbearer a task made easier by the Talon Warren of the Imas being present. This made it difficult for Opan to intervene. As soon as the adjunct was out of sight, Sari moved forward in silence. She held her garrote in her hands. The hounds howled again, and Hairlock said, You'll have to wait a little longer to die, Captain. I've no intention of allowing things to be rushed. No, I wish to linger over your demise. <laughs> Remember the tone he's using here. We'll come back to it. that in a moment. <laughs> what I love is I I always imagine he's on the – you see this guy sitting there with his hands out going, and everyone will suffer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just like you know, some maniacal laughter. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. I've got to leave. Remember, <laughs> I will be back, and yeah. what I will do will be worse and more. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. The, the future promise. Yes. <laughs> yeah, just the, the quick 180, though, from him. It's always amazes me. Yeah. Yeah. Perrin shrugged, resigned to his fate. If the hounds arrived and Hairlock was gone, they would take out their frustrations on him. The fact that it made little difference to him surprised him. He said, You'll come to regret the opportunity, Hairlock. Whether this sword's magic is meant for you or not, I was looking forward to chopping you into kindling. Is your magic a match for my hatred? It would have been nice to find out. <laughs> Let's a, dial it back, Perrin. It's a little melodramatic. I'm getting flashes of Anakin yelling at Obi-Wan here. <laughs> I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Thanks for that cinematic gold there, Mr. Lucas. <laughs> Gee whiz. I mean, dude, that's Darth Vader. That, 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 it's like, please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hashtag not my Darth Vader. <laughs> oh, oh, brilliant! That's a. That, are we the future home of not my, of not my Darth Vader? dot com? Oh my goodness! The future oh, home man. of not my Darth Vader dot com. I'll tell you what, man. When I went and saw Rogue One in the theater. Mm -hmm. And there was that scene at the end of it where Darth Vader comes into that hallway mm -hmm. and takes all those dudes out. Oh my god, uh, I lost it. It that because you've watch never the, seen him. Watch Boba Fett, dude. Watch Boba on. Fett. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, you no, you mean Obi Wan, right? Oh, sorry, Obi Wan. Yeah, but okay. all of it. It's kind of yeah. all tied together, dude. Okay, but uh, in all the movies that we saw, you never saw. Darth Vader in Darth Vader form, right? Not Anakin Skywalker mm, fighting yes. at that level. Yes. And when they brought that out with the savagery that they showed in that hallway, I was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, that's just one of those scenes. I had yeah. to watch it a couple times. You know? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think I watched that four or five times. Yeah. That scene. Sick. I, Cause it, it was, yeah, it was great. That's why, that's why Made you the must whole movie. Want, it's there. Okay. Agreed. I agree. in the, Obi-Wan, there is a certain character that is on par acting with episode one through three of, of Anakin. Okay. I'm, she's just not, she's not, she's not terrible, but she, she's, I know she's exactly not, who you're talking about. You, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but dude, <laughs> there is a lot of Darth. There is a lot of Darth Vader. There is significant okay. chunks of some Darth Vader action that it is worth I I found it quite worth it overall because there was some satisfying Darth um, stuff there that was really um, same savagery, same meanness. Pulling, a, he pulls. A, I'm sorry, I, is this a spoiler for? Do I care if I spoil a television show for people? I only uh, care about spoiling should. the Malaz we, universe. Okay, we, we probably I'll should, stop. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll hush. Okay. okay. Yeah, we need to get back on track here. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. 
Hey, professional aggression. Right. So, <laughs> at work. So, Parent has just said, Drop is your cinematic. magic a match yes. for my hatred? And Hairlock said, oh, sudden bravery. What do you know of hatred, Captain? When I return, I'll show you precisely what hatred can achieve. <laughs> And from Hairlock, he has the one up him. You know, yeah. he has the one up. Him. I love that one up. Yeah. It's just can't mm-hmm. let him say it and move on. Oh. Hairlock turned and gestured, causing another tear to open a dozen feet away. It exuded a fetid stench. I have to wonder what Warren that is. Do you think it's the chaos polluting the Warren he uses, or is it just the chaos nasty? Just that kind. It smells nasty too. No one ever says that about the chaos that I heard. I just imagine it's kind of sulfuric, smelling like yeah. rotten eggs. Yeah. I, I think it's hellish, probably the, got, the an of idea chaos. of a, you know, kind of hellish landscape. I mean, it's, you know, I'm talking about sulfur, sulfur and, you know. Yeah. Not much living there. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, the spar of the Andy, I think that was in the Warren of Chaos, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 But, so they yeah, kind of described at the Which, that's the heart. Yeah. I guess you never saw the base of it, really. So okay. No, it was in, in clouds. It said it was shrouded in clouds. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hairlock muttered, "Stubborn <laughs> mutts." Until later, Captain. He scurried for the rent. In the hut, Quick Ben grinned savagely. He jerked his dagger free and, in a single motion, sliced the strings connecting the sticks. <laughs> he hissed, "Goodbye, Hairlock." Perrin saw Hairlock flop on his stomach, and his eyes widened. Hairlock let loose a shriek. Perrin said, Looks like somebody cut your strings, Hairlock. <laughs> the hounds were close. They'd be upon them in moments. Hairlock cried, Your life, Captain! Fling me into the warren and your life is yours! I swear it! Quite the tone change from mm-hmm. a few seconds ago. And he's oh, done this before, where he insulted or threatened yes. somebody, then moments later he's begging for their help. I think it was during the first attack with the hounds, right, in Tattersail's yes. quarters? Yes. Yeah. Was, it was Tattersail, wasn't it? He threatened wasn't, Tattersail, Threatens I her, believe. then says, you yeah. take care of it, and, I'm not, and he hides in his box. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, how is Hairlock planning on guaranteeing Perrin will be ripped <laughs> apart by the hounds when they arrive? If Perrin did end up throwing him into the rent, right? Yeah, yes, he'd just be out of there. He wouldn't he, do anything. Yeah, that's... yeah, he's running from the hounds himself. Yes, it's like yeah, what you know, you're trying to run from the hounds yourself. So, yeah, yeah. what can you do? Mm-hmm. Perrin didn't respond or make a move to help Hairlock. <laughs> Hairlock <laughs> snarled, "Pawn of Opan, I would spit on you if I could. Spit on your soul." He did not. There love he is. That. The Seven Cities <laughs> coming out. <laughs> Yeah, he did not love that, did he? <laughs> he did not love it. <laughs> the ground shook as the hounds arrived. They moved around Perrin silently and closed in on Hairlock. Perrin recognized Gear, the hound he had wounded. He felt Chance answering the challenge in his hand. Gear's head swung in his direction, and Perrin saw a promise in his eyes. Perrin smiled, thinking, if anything draws Opon out, it will be the fight to come. I think Perrin's actually wrong here. We haven't yeah. seen any indication that Opon has any intention of directly involving themselves in any of the proceedings. They prefer to manipulate from behind the scenes. Yes. And when we did see the lad out of Opon, because it's the lad and the lady, he seemed particularly cowardly. That's he later in this episode. Tur- or later, no, later was, in that, that, not this episode, this when- chapter. Right, but that well, even, no, that happened when they first when when the, they first heard the hounds. He was the oh, first right. one to say, "Let's bail." When that was talking mm-hmm. about helping Parent, yeah, when he was dead, so at Hood's Gate, right, right, and then later in this chapter, which will be next week, yeah, he, yeah he's he is. very cowardly when he's he brought into the picture. <laughs> yes, he is. Yeah, so that that stuff makes me think they don't have any interest in this martial combat. So for they play games. Parent to assume that they would be interested in getting involved at yeah. that level. It, it just seems the wrong thought. It, very wrong. He, that's, that would be a, that's a critical failure role. That's a, that's a guaranteed <laughs> one, sir. He's, <laughs> well, There's but no net he, sum but game he for them here. he thinks he knows. That's yes, the thing. Yes. He thinks well, he knows, but he doesn't actually Anakin, know. Yeah, he's got his Anakin melodrama going on this chapter. <laughs> I forgot. I think this is why I carry 
overall sometimes a kind of a negative attitude toward parent and they, and there's no reason for that parent is parent is somebody, somebody we're supposed to be grounded with mm-hmm. i feel but he kind of anakin's out on us here a couple times and you know he does it a couple he times he is supposed to be all upset about tattersill dying sure you know when you're in that mental state that That's when true. you got vengeance in your heart That's you're not true. exactly thinking straight this is true i agree Herlock shrieked one last time, then the hounds were upon him. A large shadow passed, and Perrin looked up to see a great raven fly past. It cawed hungrily, and Perrin said, Too bad. I doubt its remains would be palatable. <laughs> the raven was probably happy to see the individual responsible for killing all its kin meet its end, yeah. right? Yeah. You think it's crone? It could be, because I think she shows up relatively quickly later in the chapter. Yeah, I'm thinking, well, somebody does relatively quickly, so. (laughs) Yeah, uh uh-huh. Three of the hounds began fighting over the splinters that remained of Hairlock. What an image. (laughs) The remaining four, led by Gear, turned to Perrin. Perrin raised his sword and entered a defensive crouch. He said, come on, then. Through me to the (laughs) god using me. Just once, let the tool turn in the twins' hands. Come on, hounds. Let us soak this ground with blood. (laughs) <laughs> Again, so dramatic. Oh my goodness! This is something you hear from Leonidas in Three Hundred. <laughs> I know it. I need to, I'm, you straight know out of Zack Snyder movie. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, you know, KP has not seen Three Hundred. Maybe I'll maybe I'll have to go watch Three Hundred after this. After these okay. bold declarations, because I too yeah. love those bold declarations. <laughs> I wish I could walk around. It's you know, it's like that. There's those the Esselmont books. There's the one guy that walks around with the heavy boots on. I can't remember. And he's part like. He's a character that's real comical, and he shows up in some crazy armor that tends to, you know, he, and he always talks, and he kind of spells out what he's doing, and he crept out of the room, and no one was aware, and he's, like, narrating <laughs> everything he does, like, really loudly, too. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> but he's real strong, and he fights like a madman. He's a real funny character that Esselmont, it's, it's one of Esselmont's great comic reliefs. I, I got to find out. It's, he's in the book I'm reading now. I'll, I'll, I'll look for it. Okay. And see if I can find it for you. The hounds fanned out in a half circle with gear in the center. Perrin's smile broadened and he thought, come to me, gear. I'm tired of being used and death doesn't seem so frightening anymore. Let's be done with it. I'll quote this part directly. (laughs) Quote, something heavy pressed down on him as if a hand had reached down from the sky and tried to drive him into the earth. The hounds flinched. Perrin staggered, unable to breathe a sudden darkness closing around the edges of his vision. The ground groaned beneath him, the yellowed grasses of the plain lying flat. Then the pressure lifted and chilled air flooded back into his lungs, sensing a presence, the captain world, end quote. Mm. What an entrance. Yes. And this is quite different than Rake's arrival on the rooftop fight with Pearl earlier in the book, because he was kind of just floating down there. Yeah. Do you think... It was different because of the way he arrived by sorcery this time. Do you think it has to do with his draconic, like his draconic form, or is it the sword? The sword hasn't been unsheathed yet. We see that effect in a minute. We yeah, don't know it, if he did arrive by dragon or if he came by Warren. Yeah, and the same thing with Baruch, because remember Baruch had this same almost this uh, the mm-hmm. same kind of reaction, and his house did. His, that's a good. That's a good creaking. point. Yeah. Uh, that's got to be the Warren thing. Yeah, right? it must be his entrance through the Warren is just elder. It's just so strong. <laughs> it's yeah. just when it comes into our our or comes into the mortal realm, the norm, whatever the the you know whatever world this is, the Malazan universe. It just is really it's really strong. Apparently. Hmm. Yeah. Rake pushed past Perrin and said, "Step aside." <laughs> Perrin almost dropped his sword. He doesn't know it's Rake. He just knows he's a Tistandi right. at this point. I'm going to be referring to him as Rake. Yeah. yeah okay. Rake stood before the hounds. Dragnapur was strapped to, strapped to his back. He made no move to reach for it. The hounds arrayed themselves before Rake, shifting nervously, warily eyeing him. Rake glanced at Perrin and said, Whatever you've done to draw the attention of gods, it was unwise. He spoke in Malazan. <laughs> Parents said, it seems I never learned. <laughs> oh, man, great response. Yes. I think, Rake, I think Rake has been pleasantly surprised in the past couple of chapters. First, Baruch talking like an equal to him a, a chapter or two back. And now Perrin's lip 
classic. Mm-hmm. It's great. I love it. I got to give a little smile. You know, I love it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Rick smiled and said, then we are much alike, mortal. In his mind, Perrin thought, mortal? <laughs> <laughs> the hounds were pacing back and forth, growling and snapping the air. Rake said, enough meddling. I see you, rude. Take your kin and leave. Tell Shadow Throne I won't tolerate his interference. My battle with Malaz is my own. Darujistan is not for him. Rude was the lone hound not growling. Rake said, you have heard my warning, Rude. Rake then cocked his head and turned to Perrin, then said, gear wishes you dead. Perrin said, it's the price I pay for showing mercy. <laughs> <laughs> At first, I was a little confused with this statement, wondering mm-hmm. how he was merciful by attacking Gear. Then I remembered that he had warned Gear of Hairlock's attempt to steal his soul. Is that what he's right. referring to here? Yes, that's the only thing I could think of. And that, yeah, what lack of gratitude, though. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But I mean, then he's forgetting. He, did, he stabbed yeah. him in the. He did heart. stab him. Man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he did stab him in a grievous chest wound. Yeah. Yeah. Rake raised an eyebrow, and Perrin shrugged, then said, See the scar he carries? Rake said, That was your mistake, mortal. You must finish what you set out to do. <laughs> ah, the wisdom of the ancients. What? <laughs> yeah. Is this the ancients' way of saying you got to remember to always put two in the head? <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> or take off the head, at least. It's like, at yeah. least remove the head. You know, like, <laughs> if the head lives, it's okay. It can't do much then, but hey. <laughs> mm-hmm. Perrin said, Next time. What happens now? Rake responded, For the moment, mortal, they find the thought of killing me more desirable than that of killing you. Perrin asked what their chances of success were. Rake said, The answer to that is evident in how long they've been hesitating. Wouldn't you think, mortal? The attack the hounds unleashed were faster than anything Perrin could have imagined. As he stepped back, an invisible fist of darkness exploded behind his eyes. He heard the snapping of massive chains and the groan of huge wooden wheels. He squeezed his eyes shut from the staggering pain, then forced them open again. The fight was over. Rake had his sword in his hands, its black blade slick with blood. The blood boiled away to become ash. Two dead hounds lay on either side of him. One of them was nearly decapitated. The other had a slice across the chest. The latter did not look like a killing blow, but the hound lay dead nonetheless. Rude yelped, and the other hounds backed away. Perrin had blood in his mouth. He spat. Blood was also trickling from his eyes and ears. Rake turned to Perrin, a look of death in his eyes. Perrin stepped back and raised his sword defensively. The action took all the strength he had. Rake shook his head and said, For a moment I thought, No, I see nothing now. Perrin stated, you just killed two hounds of shadow, Rake said. The others withdrew, <laughs> meaning that all of them would be dead if they had attacked, right? Yes, they would have. Yeah. I believe so. The question is, could they have done something? Could they have hurt Rake? No, no way. I mean, if all he has to do but, is slice them. Yeah, that's true, because that, that's, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that sword's nasty. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't think he would have had any issue killing all of them. No, I think you're right. Perrin asked who he was. Rake didn't respond. His attention was on the hounds. I'm going to stop there because that's about halfway through the chapter. And the next conversation does carry on for a little bit. So I think that's a good stopping point for now. It is. It's a good stopping point. This whole thing with Perrin spitting out blood and then blood coming out of his ears and his eyes. Mm -hmm. It's like someone that's survived an explosion when the shock wave passes through them. Yeah. Isn't it? That's yeah. That's how I see it. That's how I see yeah. it. that's just that's what being near for a, for a, for just the for us normal folks apparently being near that thing when it's even taken out of its scabbard just mm-hmm. does that to you. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty wild. That's pretty nasty. Yeah, that's nasty, dude. That's N- nasty. Nasty. Yeah, nasty. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for standout moments, Quick Ben cutting Hairlock strings and trapping him in place. Oh, Beautiful. Yeah. I love it. I like Lauren attacking all the Phoenix and regulars. You li- actually all- liked her attacking them? Well, I don't like it, but I just enjoy <laughs> that scene. It's it's mm. a good scene because it's where it, it's because this chapter, some crucial things will happen next next part. It's all kind of all tied in together. Mm-hmm. So it, it all ties into it's it all ties into moments I don't forget 
and this, you know, I don't forget things. I'm, I have a really strong memory about a lot of things and things I like in particular, I strongly remember them. And mm -hmm. this, like that, that's what gardens of the moon to me has more of that because it was my introduction. Okay. And everything else stays at this level and gets stronger. So it's just, it's nothing but one after the other of just amazing imagery after another anyhow. But yeah. it's just because it was my introduction and I was just so like blown away. that It's like, how does this keep getting better? Yeah. <laughs> how does it keep getting so much more awesome? But And all the stuff with Harrowlock, of course, but the strings and the hounds, the him getting torn to pieces is just rough. Yeah. On the point of Lauren attacking the Phoenix in regulars, it mm -hmm. was cool to see her martial prowess again yeah. because she reacted immediately. She took call out like it was nothing. Nothing. I mean, she did take a hit from Marilio, but Marilio is in a death. It's basically, she, yeah, she un she un just assumed he was a dandy. Mm -hmm. She she screwed up on that one. But th uh, the other thing about that attack is think of the, it, it mentions the casualness of how the auditorial knife slice through regular stuff mm -hmm. like it just yeah. kind of like easily slice through these this ring i mean that's not easy right yeah it's just a really nice sword yeah mm -hmm. yeah i really enjoyed hairlock threatening perrin then immediately doing a 180 and begging for oh, help yeah. love it oh yeah love it too i do too <laughs> the threatening with one breath begging with the next mm -hmm. and parents over dramatic declarations <laughs> Leonidas you, Perrin watch, at his do you, best. Do you, do, you, do you ever watch? Do you ever watch Archer? Yeah, I think I saw did, the first three seasons. Did you watch? Remember Barry? Yeah. Remember when Barry gets hurt? He's like Archer. It's like <laughs> it's, it's it's like that. It's just like I can just imagine him like he's just like screaming like that all the time. Archer. It's like, <laughs> so so and rightfully so worked up. But, yeah. You know. And Rake's arrival. What oh. an entrance! Absolutely amazing entrance. It far outweighs any superhero landing by far. Yeah, of course. Dude. I mean, I he like flattened the, the grass <laughs> around them. I know. It, it may, it, if it makes you bleed from orifices, it's like, <laughs> I'm sorry. That kind of outdoes, that outdoes a lot of things. If it gives you a headache because he arrives, it's like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> I nice also level. like, mm -hmm. yeah, and I like Rake's smile at Perrin's lip about never learning. Mm hmm. Yeah. It kind of humanizes uh, him a little bit. It does. It makes him a lot more human. And I think he, yeah. I think that's I think he's surprised twice. Like I said, we've seen him tw twice kind of pleasantly surprised. It's, he's like, you know what? I kind of forget that the humans can kind of surprise me every now and then. I like this. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, I already mentioned this, but I'll say the image of the hounds tearing hair walk apart. That's I don't want that for that's a terrible fate, dude. If you're a human, you would die quicker, wouldn't you? Because you'd at least come apart pretty easily and be crushed. But I think that's this a good lasted. question. Who who knows at what point Hairlock's soul would leave that vessel? Does it? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting question. Yes, it is. Yeah. Hmm. And what happens? What shard does it stay in, or does it get split yeah, right? between all of them? You get into oh. some real technical stuff there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Rake's battle with the hounds was also pretty cool. <laughs> what battle? <laughs> Dude, Pan blinked and missed the whole thing. He's blinking the blood out of his eyes from him untake from taking Dragnapur out. He looks mm -hmm. up, it's like sheathed again, and it's like and the things are dead. Okay, the aftermath of the battle. So yeah. where we found okay, out we what happened. <laughs> Our forensic Ex analysis accepted, of the battle. Except it's uh, <laughs> except it's uh, <laughs> it must the, the, the battle must have been amazing had we seen it. Yeah, <laughs> had, had we been able to see it, it mm -hmm. would have been amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. for now we can only imagine. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Cool. All right. Do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, it's really starting to. It's well, I keep saying this all the time. It's really heating up, folks. It's really heating up. It's it really, really is. It, though. it does every it time. It really is. Mm -hmm. And so I truly love this book again and again. Erickson's ability to escalate matters page after page never fails to amaze me. It's just a great episode, though. Yeah, great and episode. next week's going to be really good, too, oh, because yeah. we're going to get to see some really interesting stuff. Yeah, can't wait. Yeah, Excited. definitely. Cool. All right, well, thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll thanks see you next again. week. Yep. Next, see you next time. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. 
Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.